Hello, welcome back to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with Jamie, and we are going to continue our mini series on Proverbs 31. Specifically, how does the Proverbs 31 woman pray? If you did not listen to our intro, I really would love for everyone to go and listen to that because there's some baggage with Proverbs 31, and I hope that we did an okay job um, demystifying this in in coming into our discussion with the grace that sometimes lacks when people talk about this Proverbs 31 wife. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just looking at you and you're just so quiet. You're just giving me this smile like, yep, keep it up, keep going. <laughs> I know, I know. Actually, I so in, in case you missed our, if you missed our intro, I am dealing with a migraine. It's getting better but I'm still like a little bit of like the brain fog, like the Aww. really slow gears turning. So I was like, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, but no, no, I, I hear here. I, I'm excited to del you know, dive into this. Cause I, yeah. I definitely would love to just get into the, the text of this to just kind of talk about some of these different, um, different things that, uh, that scripture says about yeah. a life of noble character. Yeah. And most people think about this as a passage on being a wife and being a mom. And so I'm really excited to look at this from the context of being a, a prayer warrior, right? How does the Proverbs 31 woman pray? So let's go ahead and jump in. So basically our format for this mini series, we're just going to kind of take it verse by verse and talk about the things that jump out to us, the takeaways that we can glean. So we are in the NIV. Is that what we have up here, Jamie? Yeah, this is NIV. Okay. So we're going to start with Proverbs 31, verse 10. A wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. So when I was subbing last school year for the high school English teacher, one of the classes they were doing this poetry unit. And I just think it's, it was, I am never going to be a fan of multiple choice in poetry, like existing in the same like classroom. But one of the things that they did, they had this kind of formula for how to analyze a poem. And in my first, I was like, you can't use a formula to analyze a poem. But we went through it and I actually liked it. One of the things that they did was kind of like one of the first things they did was how can you paraphrase this so um i'm putting on my mrs terry sub hat for half a second jamie how how would you paraphrase this passage and and do you need a reminder of what paraphrase means <laughs> i might with my oh. current state of brain i'm sorry i was not trying to be condescending i was trying to be funny <laughs> no i'm just kidding i actually might need the reminder no i'm good i could paraphrase um so when I read this, I get this picture. I'm not going to give you a paraphrase. I'm going to give you the, the, the picture that comes into my head, okay. which is like the opposite of what this, like basically when it talks <laughs> about like, she's worth far more than rubies. Her husband uh -huh. has full confidence, lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. What I picture is this person which we established was this is the dad king lemuel talking to his son mm -hmm. about something that his mother told him mm -hmm. and i'm picturing that mother thinking about the worst daughter-in-law possible like basically <laughs> who, you know she basically like you know she brings him good not harm all the days of her life and so what i picture <laughs> is like she's thinking what i want for you is not the daughter-in-law that's all for herself. She brings you good and not harm. Mm -hmm. She is, she's the woman behind the man in a, in a yeah. non misogynistic way, <laughs> mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. she is yeah. behind you. Um, it doesn't matter how rich you are. If you have that opposite woman, like if you have the woman that wants to harm you, um, it doesn't matter. You're going to be miserable your whole life. So the, you know, the, your husband will have for, full confidence in you as, as that wife, um, and lacking nothing of value, meaning she's not out to get him. She's 
on the same team. Like a lot of times mm-hmm. with my husband and I, like when we have arguments, I'm like, look, we're on the same team. Like yes. we're not enemies. And I think that it's, it's that idea of, um, of, of one fleshness, you know, it's not like two people coming together and wanting the best for themselves. It's she wants the best for you. You want the best mm-hmm. for her and you've got full confidence in her in whatever way. And I think that goes both ways though. Cause a lot of these things, as you yeah. read through some of this, I think some of it is instruction for, for the husband, because a lot of these things, as you go through, it's like, Oh, that's all well and good that she's this, but it also says her husband praises her at the gates and you have yeah. to be a certain kind of husband to do that too. So exactly. here it's talking like, yes, your husband has full con the, the husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. But, um, but you know, that confidence I think is instilled in it, or it comes from her desire to be on the same team with him, to support him. Yeah. And yeah, to be the opposite of the caricature evil daughter in law. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I don't know. I think the uh, the mother in law caricature is probably more prevalent. <laughs> it probably is. I'm just, yeah, yeah, I'm sure so, that it is. I like too that we can use this as a springboard for praying for ourselves, for our daughters, for the women in our lives, but we can use this as a springboard to pray for our husbands if we've got them, right? Mm-hmm. And so this would be a really easy, um, so this wouldn't be a paraphrase, but it would kind of be, okay, how can I, yeah, I guess, how would I paraphrase this into a prayer for my husband? It could be, may my husband have full confidence in me. May my husband lack nothing of value. I love that prayer. Um, may my husband lack nothing of value or, or a prayer of intercession for anybody um, because it covers so many contingencies that our finite brains wouldn't even think of, right? Like another prayer I love is just help me to not do any harm, right? Because you just, that covers so many bases. <laughs> and and in this one, it was, yeah, help help me to lack nothing of value or help the Hamptons to lack nothing of value or help my children to lack nothing of value. Um, because again, that just covers all the bases because there are certain things. And I, I know I've had this experience. I'm going to guess you have too, where God gives you a blessing that you didn't even know to have asked for. Yes. Right. And I feel like this type of prayer is covering exactly those. It happened to me a lot when I was pregnant with Silas, we were at a church that was very, it was a very close knit type of family. And by the time I got pregnant with Silas, he's our second son, but it was our third pregnancy. And I had learned by then just how depressed I would get from pregnancy and the hormones and the tiredness. And there were days where God just flipped a switch where I went from barely functioning to, okay, I feel okay. And I really had this sense of like somebody at church just decided to pray for me at that moment. And I feel like this is, you know, it's kind of that, like whatever they're going through, like we were talking in the last episode about your son and doing his kind of, it's not basic training, right? It's, it's called something else, but it's like a a bit campy thing. It's called beast barracks or cadet basic training, basically. Okay. CBT. Okay. So you're not going to know everything he's going through. So I think a great prayer could be yeah, help him to lack nothing of value, help him to have what he needs when he needs it, because I'm sure not going to know apart from the Holy spirit telling me or my intuition kicking in, I'm not going to know how to pray specifically for each thing that he needs. Right. He might be asleep. He might be running. He might be, you know what I mean? So I love this prayer. Yeah. Lack, lack nothing of value. Cause it does kind of cover so many, so many bases. Um, and then when we go to verse 12, it says she brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. And so again, I think your initial reaction to this could be, oh, <laughs> do you need to pause? Hey, we're back. <laughs> um, I, I forget where we, oh, okay. So we had moved on to, she brings him good, not harm all the days of her life. I think that an initial reaction to this could be, 
oh rats, I'm doing this so poorly, <laughs> right? Because there, there's almost this, um, this assumption, oh, well then if my husband's going through something that's not good, that must be my fault, <laughs> right? Either I am directly responsible for not bringing good to him, or I'm indirectly responsible by, by not praying for him like I should. And I don't, I don't see that in there. I just see it as we can be a blessing to our husband. And I, again, I think it's so important to remember like the context and the genre of what we're reading, right? This is from Proverbs. This is a wisdom book. This is a poem. This is not meant to be the 10 commandments for women, right? I, there are things in here that we can use as guidelines for sure, but there's not that heavy sense of condemnation of, um, so therefore, if your husband's not having a great day, you're a terrible wife. Like I remember I grew up in an environment where like, if somebody was mad at me, it felt very, very, um, just kind of unsafe and dangerous, like not in a physically abusive way, but it just, it was like, oh no, if someone is mad at me, that must mean I am a bad person. And so I had to really remind myself because, um, we grew up in a family where you didn't show anger, right? And if you could never lose your temper, like that was the epitome of, of being um, self-controlled. And and Scott will get angry at things and sometimes even righteously so, like not in a, oh no, what a terrible person, but he will get angry and I need to remind myself, okay, just because my husband is angry does not make me a bad wife because that is immediately what my reaction was. So like <laughs> Scott was trying to fix our, our sink backs up like every couple months. And it's this big old mess to try to clear out whatever clog is there. And so Scott was frustrated and I was there to be like the person handing in the tools and stuff. <laughs> Scott's upset and our puppy she just ran to her crate and put herself to bed because she was scared because daddy's angry and like sometimes that's how I feel and I need to remind myself okay my husband is mad because he's fixing a sink that's causing him frustration it has not but in my brain I think to myself if I had been a better wife I would have seen this coming right <laughs> or something like that or I would be able to say the right thing to make him not be angry but no like sometimes sometimes I get angry so Again, I think this is important to remind ourselves. Yes, in general, over the course of a lifetime, we should bring our husbands good and not harm. If they have a bad day and get upset because someone cut them off in traffic, that has zero to do with you, me, our relationship, our marriage, our standing before God or anything like that. Well, that's that's a really good point. I've been dealing with this a lot with our whole move situation. Mm -hmm. And I do this because I we've talked about this before, like I can be probably on the verge of toxically positive in terms yeah. of trying to pull the rug over any kind of bad feelings because I just want peace. Mm -hmm. I want mm -hmm. everyone to be happy, very similar to yeah. what you're talking about. Any little bit of conflict. We, our mm -hmm. dog does the same thing. If Aww, someone is unhappy Archie. or even on TV, <laughs> if there are people yelling oh, no. at each other, or if I even yell upstairs to the kids. I was there once and you weren't yeah. even like and yelling, he angry skitters, yelling. No, no. And he skitters <laughs> yeah. off. It's like. He did. He got himself stuck in the bathroom. He was so scared. <laughs> yes. He loves to do that. That's like his den kind of. He'll go and it's like he intentionally closes the door. He can tell I'm talking about him. He's. Oh, that's hilarious. But yeah, so, but I, I feel this need to keep it positive and not mm. only just be positive myself, but I feel the need to like the responsibility for yeah. my husband's happiness. Yeah. And I think it's really important not to read this. She brings him good, not harm all the days of her life, not to bring in the added baggage of feeling the responsibility to control your spouse and to control right. their emotions. And furthermore, what God has been teaching me is sometimes in order to bring him good, sometimes it can harm him. When I try to brush right. past his negative emotions, when I don't allow him to feel negative feelings and express them mm -hmm. and entertain them and feel heard because I don't want to hear it. And yeah. so, um, yeah, that, that's been something that I've really been dealing with. And even just today feeling like just, wow, I, I need to remember that my, I'm responsible for me. I'm yeah. responsible for, um, but I'm, I'm also 
responsible for allowing him to be him. I don't, right. he doesn't have to, I don't have to expect or demand that he feels the same way as me or make mm -hmm. him. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. I'm so glad I'm not the only woman who struggles with that. And I think yeah. that uh, we could almost do a charity check in our heart, right? If you hear about, um, let's say you discover that someone at your church is an alcoholic. If your first reaction is, I wonder what his wife's doing to make him drink so much. That's not a charitable response. Right. And again, that's not a healthy boundary because, you know, I think that, yeah, as, as you and I are getting older, we're realizing, okay, I'm responsible for me. He's responsible for him. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to put the flip side. You're saying that sometimes bringing your husband good and not harm means letting him kind of just be, be in a negative spot and not trying to fix it. Sometimes bringing your husband good and not harm could mean I am going to call out this issue, right? Right. Um, so there's there's a balance there. But again, I think it's always bringing good and not harm, I think is the end result. It's not every minute of the day. Like our, our middle son, he cut himself and we ended up going to the urgent care because it just would oh. not stop bleeding. And he did not need stitches, but the, the doctor did have... Um, have him use the, the debridement brush or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And um, that hurts, right? Like you can't deny that that is a painful experience to like go over and over an open wound with a like very fine. Yeah. Like it's, it's icky, but it's for his good. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so sometimes bringing your husband good or, or just in any relationship, right? Like, um, I'm trying to think if you've ever called me out on something. And and I think we're both just too, too gentle to do that. But but we could, right? Like if if we really um if it was for that person's betterment, I know what I did. I tell we'll cut this if you don't want me to share it. But I kind of called you out because um basically it was like would would you want your daughter to grow up with this sort of oh right mentality no I and... love being called out I really do and you've done <laughs> that in a very kind and gentle way at least a few times yeah and, and yeah. I I value that so much and but no absolutely this was yeah no I remember that one that, that mm -hmm. was that in relation to like negative self talk and, I believe so yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um and. Yeah, it might not feel great at that exact second, mm -hmm. but it can result in the greater good or having that difficult discussion with your spouse or with someone at your church, right? Like, oh, I hate to have to bring this up, but like if you've been stewing over something for like years that somebody at church did to you, it might be time to just clear the air. Now, mm -hmm. the Bible verse that says like when your brother has sinned against you, go and show him his fault between the two of you. I don't think that means that we need to air all our dirty laundry anytime. Like, <laughs> I don't think that means I need to go and force someone to try to make amends with me for something they did to me 12 years ago. <laughs> right. I don't think that's what it's saying. Right. But... Sometimes that can cause more <laughs> yeah. drama than needs to be had. <laughs> Jamie, I really want to talk to you. And I want you to know that I totally forgive you for nine years ago when I came to your house and you were out of coffee, right? Like that's, that's not beneficial or helpful. I put too much syrup in your latte. <laughs> that's right. And I was jittery. Like you don't, you don't know how bad I felt for the next five minutes. Cause I was right. jittery, you know, but truly like if there's something I've done this with Scott, there's like, if there's something that I am still mulling over days afterward, yeah. even if like, if, if I could snap my fingers and get over it, I totally would. <laughs> But because I obviously can't, um, I will sometimes be like, hey, just so that it doesn't turn into like a bigger thing, I just wanted you to know I'm still kind of mulling over this. I just wanted to bring it up, right? And, you know, so sometimes doing what is, what's going to bring someone good might be painful for you or them in the moment, um, and that's why tact and diligence and um, discernment about when the right time is, I think those are all really important. I think Esther's a great example of that. When she had to go and approach um, oh, the king, yeah. Yeah. She, she 
pulls out everything. She does all of it. She makes the big old feast and she tells him, I have something really important to tell you. And, and then she realizes, oh, now's not the right time. Let's do the whole thing over again tomorrow. Like there's a, there's a time to be discerning. I don't love the idea of us walking on eggshells, especially around our spouses, but sometimes you're going to know, okay, now's not the time to bring this up. Um, but maybe it is something that should get brought up at a later moment, even if it feels unpleasant at the time. Yeah. And I can't think of the actual example of what happened, but I just remember more than once that I've had times where I've had a question about timing and I've prayed about it and mm -hmm. God has given me the the signal. He's been like, okay. Yeah. And I've known like, because I was sensitive to God's mm -hmm. leading because I was yeah. really praying for wisdom. Um, so I just think the whole bring him good, not harm the same action can bring good in one circumstance and harm in another circumstance. Oh, for sure. And so mm -hmm. I think that is why as, as wives, if we're striving to be, um, you know, striving to move in the direction of becoming more Christ-like and more, you know, more of noble character, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, not to say the Proverbs 31 woman is Christ, but, uh, but no, um, I get what you're saying. Yeah. But, but as we're striving to, to become better, I think that's why it's so important to be just always checking it, like having prayer be kind of that, that backbone of, of your relationship. So you can be checking in with yourself. You can be praying mm -hmm. for him and know, you know, you can always pray always like, you know, for instance, in a situation where there's something going on and you don't know whether to to take action or to talk about it you can yeah. always pray like that's always mm -hmm. okay and that's always good yeah and it's always at work and at the same time praying for this situation but also show me what how can i bring good not harm is it by being mm -hmm. quiet is it right. by tactfully at the right moment bringing it up um and what i have found is that i is that it might get brought up by the person that needs to talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like your spouse might be the one to bring it up. And then it's like, oh, okay, I guess that's the open door. I guess this is the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think about that with witnessing too. Yeah. Um, I am a shy witnesser. Yeah, I am not, <laughs> I'm not like my grandma. Do you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Right. Um, and if I truly feel like God is putting it on my heart to reach out evangelistically to somebody, um, my go-to is always, all right, God, open the right doors of conversation at the right time, because mm -hmm. I'm not the type to thrust those doors open and barge in like Aragorn, you know, just <laughs> bam in the doors open and, you know, swaggering in. Um, and he does like, he has never not answered that prayer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I love that. Um, a prayer for bringing good and not harm. One of the things that I love to do, and I definitely don't do this every night, but sometimes I go through kind of a, um, a reflection of my day as kind of a prayer routine. And one of the things I like to do with that is like, who are some random people that I just like said hi to at the post office? Or do you know what I mean? Like, what is a very brief encounter I had today? And then I try to remind myself to, to say a prayer or blessing for somebody that I just brushed shoulders with. Um, and I think that that could be cool too. Like, imagine this is me putting on my novelist cap, like how powerful it could be. But imagine like somebody, especially someone in like a busy city like Manhattan. And like, before you leave your home, you pray like, God, help me to, um, to be, a blessing and to spread your love to everybody that I interact with today, right? Help me to know the right things to pray for the strangers that I see on the bus. Help me to be at the right place at the right time for the chance to do something good for somebody. Um, those kinds of prayers can be so powerful. It's kind of the opposite of the prayer of do no harm, right? Help me to do good. Mm -hmm. um, whatever I am going about today, help me to... Um, pray for the right people or just, again, help me to be at the right place at the right time for somebody who might need it. Um, 
those are those are really powerful prayers. And then you can also take those and pray those as prayers for the people on your prayer list, right? For the for the missionaries or for your children or your pastor. Help them be at the right place at the right time. Help them to be doing good. Um, may the people they encounter be blessed because of the interactions they had with my child today. That's a cool prayer, right? May this teacher be blessed because my son was in her class this year. That's that's a pretty neat prayer to be praying for our families and our loved ones. Yeah, I love that. Um, so before we wrap up this section, I, I want to chat too about her husband has full confidence in her. So we've talked a lot about the lacking nothing of value. Um, the full confidence though, I think, I mean, that tells us as much, like you said, it tells us as much about the husband (laughs) as it does about the wife, right? He's not, um, he's not jealous. He's not intimidated. He's not, um, like, I think there's a, a chunk of husbands who, if their wives maybe like became more successful at work or something like that, they would feel threatened, um, and, and so I love this. Um, her husband has full confidence in her. It's like, no, go and go and do what God has called you to do. Right. That is, um, that's really powerful. And I would be, pr- um, praying, especially I think about this as a springboard for prayer for couples and ministry, right? Because, um, I don't know if this is how normal this is, but there can be almost competitiveness, um, between, a husband and wife who are in ministry together, it can be like, well, I, um, I witnessed to this many people and you, you only did that many, or, you know, like God's really using me in this person's life. What is he doing with you lately? And and there's no place for that, right? We need to be celebrating just like, I mean, between you and me, it's not like, oh, Jamie got, you know, two Facebook notices from a, from a listener asking for prayer. And I only got one, you know, like, why is she, why is she doubly blessed? (laughs) Like we're not keeping track, but, um, sadly it can happen, you know, and like we've been in ministry together, we've done, um, missions training together and like it, it can become a thing. And yeah, when you're, when your husband has full confidence in you, he is going to celebrate when you are successful in ministry or in work. And it, it's not going to be like, okay, you can have this success. Just don't ever get more successful than I am. Don't make me feel threatened, you know? And, and sadly, and I don't think many people do it deliberately, but I do feel like that is a subconscious. I get, I get this from, um, from our church sometimes, sure, go ahead and even though you're a woman, we'll, we'll let you pray out loud. Just don't be over spiritual, right? Like don't, don't make people feel threatened. <laughs> and, and that's not how it should be, right? We, we're not supposed to quench the spirit. Um, so when you are in a trusting relationship, whether it's with a spouse or a ministry partner or a church body where people are celebrating, um, that's a great thing too. So yeah, for, for couples who are in ministry together, I think a great prayer for them would be just a prayer against that, um, just that weird competitive dynamic, or, you know, if God's using her more than him, does that, you know, like, is that okay? Um, it shouldn't be an issue, but in, in some cases it can turn into an issue. And so that's another area that we can be, uh, kind of praying about and praying over. Well, another thing that that brings up to me is just the idea that if your husband, what ministry or not, if your husband mm-hmm. doesn't have full confidence in you, some of that can can come from him reflecting mm-hmm. your what you're projecting. And mm-hmm. we've taught, you know, like for me, not to put the blame all on the the woman, but what mm-hmm. I have found is when I am timid or not confident or don't believe that I deserve respect or confidence mm-hmm. from anyone, not just my husband, but from anyone, if I'm projecting that timid spirit and I don't have confidence in myself, it can result in a less than ideal response. And it's really mm-hmm. funny how that works and how the way you speak about yourself, the way you speak about your ministry or your job or like, and like we talked about self-deprecation and just kind Mm -hmm. of like, I say things about myself that tear myself down 
And well, yeah, then other people are going to kind of see you that way. If, yeah. if that's what you're speaking about yourself. And even if you don't speak it and you have this extreme negative self-talk mm-hmm. in your mind, yeah. you better believe it's coming across. And so I'm not mm-hmm. saying that I've overcome it, but what I do see is that when I am less confident in myself and what I'm doing, others have less confidence in my, in me and what I'm doing. Yeah. And so not to say that there aren't people that are just going to be haters no matter what, and you shouldn't, mm-hmm. you know, right. But, and right. so I'm not saying it's, it's a, it's a one-to-one yeah. ratio, but what I'm yeah. saying is in general, um, two kinds of prayers are let's pray that we have no competition that we have the other person, you know, in either in your relationship or whatever partnership you have, just let's have that other person. Yes. God work in them, help them not to have competition, but also help me to, to feel confident. Where do I need to have full confidence in myself so that I can receive that confidence from others as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that too harsh or does that come across as being blamey? No, okay. no. Um, and I would say the flip side of that though, is like, I think I'm, I'm an example almost of the opposite where, um, like you're almost talking about a woman who's insecure. And so therefore like her husband doesn't have as much confidence in her, which mm-hmm. can happen, right. He's going right. to pick up, um, pick up those in cues. my case, it was almost, it wasn't exactly the opposite, but it, it's kind of like a complete 180. I was very insecure and my husband's kind of support and encouragement gave me the courage to step out. Like there were, um, there was one like day I remember where I was totally ready to be done writing. This was like over 10 years ago and it was his encouragement and his support and like, Nope, I believe in you. I believe that this is going to become a thing. This is going to be your calling and your ministry. Um, so for me, it, it had to come from him first. <laughs> I think that is very cool because then that is another, another side of it of like, yeah. And for us to be that person behind our spouse that believes in them and, and to reciprocate, like, let's have full confidence even when they Mm -hmm. don't and make sure that it starts with us. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Because kind of what you were saying, there's, there's so much that happens subconsciously that is so powerful, Mm -hmm. right? And this, it, this applies to everything, not just a marriage. If your son was applying to all these military academies and in your brain, you knew he was never going to get in. Even if you never said that to him, he could have picked up on that. Right. Right. It was your faith in him. The faith that said, no, I think you can do this. Let's go ahead and fill out these applications that is what got him into West Point. I, which is I pretty much am single-handedly responsible for him getting in. That's so congratulations. What That's what you're it, saying. Honestly, <laughs> more so than I think you're giving yourself credit for. <laughs> if you hadn't believed it was possible, right? Um, kind of like when Silas was a baby, we would not speak about like his limitations. Right. Not to where we were in denial. Um, we would say things like, I think this kid has pneumonia. Let's take him to the hospital. But we would not say this kid is never going to grow up to live independently. This kid is never going to um, be able to walk or talk. And he could do all of those things Um, because that, that power of words and the power of your subconscious, the power of your thinking, it does influence. It's not like this big mystical thing. If, if I was convinced that um, Silas, who had brain damage from birth, was was going to be vegetative for his entire life. Not to give myself a ton of credit. I just think this is the way God created the universe. I think it would have been a vegetable. I truly do. Um, to the point where I don't think he would have survived. I think he needed a mother who believed in him and who refused to put any limitations on him. And so like as parents, we can do that. Um, you told your son, you can get into this academy, but I'm going to help you through all the paperwork to do it. And now he's just a couple weeks away from going. Um, there, there is a huge power just in the faith that we have in our children, in our spouses. If you believe your spouse is going to be 
like terrible at whatever job he does, chances are that's somehow going to bleed into his work performance in different ways, right? Even if you never say a bad word about it, like there's so much that we communicate through our body language and things like that. Um, so yeah, I know in my case for sure that like I am an author because Scott like had full confidence that I could, <laughs> and that, that was huge, so cool. right? And so we can we can be that encouragement to our children, our spouses, our friends, our churches. Um, so yeah, I think that could be another perk to ask God, like help me to find, help me to be the encouragement that people need, right? Help me to be that Scott to that Alana on the day that she needs to know not to give up on her dreams to be a writer. Oh, I love that. Or help me to know to be um, that kind of mom who will help her son get into something like West Point, which for people who aren't familiar, like it's a huge ordeal. Um, it's a big honor. You need like congressional interviews. Like it is, it is a big, big thing um, to even apply and then to get in. So I would say like dream big dreams for your children, for your spouse, for your loved ones, for your church. And the faith that you have in their abilities is going to influence um, their the outcome, right? Just like we've, we've done it for our kids. Um, Scott did it for me. I think there is so much power that comes just when you, when you have faith in something, of course, there's the direct, I have faith that this, that my son can um, overcome his medical issues. So I'm going to pray that he will like, that's one side of faith, but there's also the faith that says, I have faith that my son is going to overcome his medical issues. So I'm not going to treat him like a future invalid. And, and so he is going to live up to the potential that, that I have for him, which Silas has. Um, yeah. So those are all the takeaways I can think of. Do you want to add anything else? No, I love that. And I love the fact that, you know, all of these things are not just applicable to a husband and wife relationship. Exactly. It's, it's lifelong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's lifelong. And that each of these things is specific, not only to each person and unique, the way that we interpret them to each person, but even to each circumstance that we find ourselves in. Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to the word of God being living and active. And so I love that. Yeah. Do you have, not to put you on the spot, because I know how much you love that. Do you have any <laughs> stories? Like, I'll tell you one of my stories so you can think about one of yours. It's just like mm -hmm. something someone said to you decades ago that has stayed with you as um, as encouragement. So, for example, I did voice lessons for like a year in high school. I was on a music track for, for a, a little bit before I got... Um, got more into the science side of things. And um, basically like the costs and my schedule and perhaps my innate ability <laughs> all contributed to me not doing voice lessons, like not continuing on. And at my very last lesson, my teacher told me, she's like, I just want you to know that you can sing. And now like okay so then then I like okay I can sing and then I had like years where like my, I would get super super hoarse I didn't sing at all now I'm trying to get my voice back in shape because I'm leading music at our church and I will still on days where I'm like what in the world am I doing singing in front of my church I will remind myself right I'll be like no she told me I can sing and she must know what she's talking about um so like, I, I hold on to that. Do you have any stories like that? Yeah. I remember, um, one of my high school English teachers, Ms. Baysmore, and she, um, I think it was like a crime and punishment unit. Cause we've talked about Russian literature mm -hmm. and I did a poem, which I mean, uh -huh. I, even I, at that time was like, man, this is a good poem about wow. crime and punishment. And, um, uh -huh. and, but I, it, I didn't realize that about myself that I, that I was mm. able to write. But anyway, I just remember her at the end of the year, um, she was like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to Virginia Tech. I'm going to be in pre-vet. And she was so disappointed. She's like, you oh. need to, she's like, you are such a gifted writer. You need, wow. to, you need to write. And I just remember her saying that. And I felt as a people pleaser, I felt bad <laughs> that I was going into <laughs> science. But, uh -huh. um, but it always kind of stuck with me and like she mm. like along the way she she said lots of things that were encouraging but I just remember her saying 
don't stop writing. Like, even if you have a career in science, don't stop writing. And, but, and I won't even say that that's been like a driving force or anything, but I look Mm -hmm. back and it's kind of like, you're saying like, if I, um, it makes, I don't know. But anyway, as, as I've gotten into, you know, obviously I'm not a veterinarian. Um, I went into laboratory research and then had kids and I wasn't, you know, I haven't been working outside the home a whole lot, but with the podcast, with the books that, and the resources that we've mm-hmm. written, um, yeah. you know, I definitely writing is still a passion for me. And so it does get to the point where I'm like, oh, why, you know, is this, does anyone really want to know yeah. anything I have to say? But I look mm-hmm. back and I'm like, what I see in that encouragement is kind of like a little Ebenezer kind of, of like God saying, God dropping hints through people. Like Mm -hmm. this is, is, you can look back and see someone else validated your writing. Mm -hmm. And I can look back on that and just be like, not that it made me change any decisions, but I can look back now that I've seen that I kind of still love writing. I can look Mm -hmm. back on that and be like, okay, God kind of helped her to, that's cool have you found her does she know you've written a book i looked after i after i published my book i looked for her and i could not find her and you should try again yeah because i did the same thing with my violin teacher i i tried 10 years ago i'm like oh she's not on facebook she's nowhere i tried again um about half a year ago and like Oh, boom. Like I found her email with the Google search. So. Oh, wow. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it was okay. Very simple. So, so I will not try up. again. I won't give up. <laughs> it was very fun connecting with my violin teacher. You and I have talked a tiny bit about um, that is how very special that was. Cool. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think it's just a reminder, like we're, we're planting seeds that might not take fruit for another couple decades. Um, and so again, asking God to bless the harvest that we might even be accidentally or unconsciously planting. I think that could be another great one too. Like 20 years after I'm dead, God, please help somebody be talking about the way I blessed their life and encouraged them. You know, those, those kinds of prayers. That's pretty cool. Yeah. All righty. Well, um, how about listener homework? Go find the one person who encouraged you <laughs> way back when and see if you can connect with them. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, that would be fun to report back. That would be fun. All right. Well, I am so excited to continue our um, our discussion. How about to close? I am going to sum up the verses that we've already talked about as kind of our blessing and benediction. So my prayer and hope for you, Jamie, and for me and for all our listeners is that you would bring um, everybody, all the loved ones in your life, that you would bring them good and not harm, um, that the good that you bring would last even longer than your earthly life does, um, that those around you would have confidence in you, and that includes you, that you would have confidence in your abilities, um, that you would lack nothing of value, and that God would use you so that your loved ones also lack nothing of value. And we hope to see you all again before long here on the Praying Christian Women podcast. <laughs>